please take your Bible, and um, we're going to turn again to Acts, the book of Acts. This time we're going to chapter 18. We've been following the Apostle Paul's missionary outreach to Europe for the, for the past five weeks. We've been looking at this, and up to this point, he's ministered in four European cities. Apostle has been to Philippi, and that was um, certainly a, a serendipitous moment for Paul and his, his co-workers. They had planned to go into Asia, but the Lord forbid them. And uh, in a vision, he saw a man from Macedonia saying, please come to us. And so there was this radical uh, redirection of his ministry to now go west into Europe. So the first city was Philippi. From Philippi, he went on down to Thessalonica, uh, from there to Berea, and then uh, to Athens. Now, after spending this uh, shorter period of time in Athens, he's coming to the city of Corinth, and that's where we pick up the story today. And Corinth is the capital city of Achaia, a Roman province. Let's read Luke's account, chapter 18, verse 1 and following. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Pris uh, Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that Christ was, the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood is on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city, who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio, the proconsul of Achaia, was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, uh, Galeo uh, said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge in these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. They all, they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. And uh, Gallio uh, paid no attention to any of this. Father, we just ask you to help us now as we try to open this text to understand what's here. Would you bring to our attention those things that will help us 
Help us understand your ways and also for us to grow in our faith. And so we commit these uh, minutes now into your hands. Bless them and feed us in Christ's name. Amen. Paul's relatively short stay in Athens while he was waiting for Silas and Timothy was rather discouraging. Now, he hadn't really planned. That was not on his itinerary to go to Athens for any period of time. But because of uh, being expelled from the other cities, and Berea being the last, he providentially finds himself in Athens. You remember last week we looked at this, and he had uh, preached. Uh, he went and preached before the council at the Areopagus. And uh, generally, the response was not that positive. The Athenians were all caught up in philosophical things. They certainly enjoyed hearing new things. They would gather so that they could hear anyone who came along with something else to say, some new idea, some unique philosophy, and way of seeing life, so that they could discuss it, they could um, debate, perhaps they could ridicule the person. It was sport to them. Paul had preached, preached as he always did, preached Christ. He preached uh, uh, wholeheartedly, passionately. But the response was not significant at all. Now, there was some success. There's a notation in chapter 17, verse 34, that Luke says some men, some men joined him and believed. But on the whole, there wasn't a great in gathering. The gospel was rejected by the Jews and ridiculed by the Greeks. So Paul went on to Corinth. It's about 45, 50 miles southwest. And um, he arrives there pretty tired. He's pretty well spent. Listen to what he writes to the Corinthians later. He says, this is 1 Corinthians, by the way, 1 Corinthians 2. The opening five verses. I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Leaving Athens, leaving that environment, that intellectual center, certainly hearing all of the lofty words and speech of those around him there, no doubt that was part of his engagement with, with them. He now travels down to Corinth. He said, I've come to you, and there's only one thing I want to do. I, I don't want to get caught up in high-sounding speech. I just want to preach a simple, straightforward gospel. I, I determined that I'd only, I'd only preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. I'm going to focus on the sacrifice of Jesus. I'm going to talk about the, the theological and the redemptive implications of that event. I want you to know that there is a Savior, one who sacrificed himself fully for you, one who paid the price for your salvation, took your judgment and your punishment. That's all I... All I really want you to know, I came in fear and trembling and uh, weakness. See, after what Paul had experienced in Athens, he's very aware. And maybe this is a, something we need to be much more aware yeah, about ourselves. He says, I came and you know, I, I, I was weak. I'm weak. I came to you as a weak man. 
as a fearful man in much trembling. Now, what does that mean? Well, Paul, Paul was keenly aware of his inadequacy, his inability to persuade people through rhetoric or human wisdom to believe the gospel. But he hadn't lost confidence in the gospel itself, nor had he lost confidence in the power of the Holy Spirit to convict and to draw people to Christ. He now is lacking in confidence in his own abilities. He's so aware, I'm inadequate. The gospel is so profound so important. People need to hear it. They need to understand. They need to be persuaded. But I can't persuade them. I think perhaps all of us understand, and if we don't, we should, that conversion is the work of the Word and Spirit in a person's life. I want you to listen, listen to a paraphrase of uh, this section in 1 Corinthians. It's uh, Eugene Peterson. I was unsure of how to go about this and felt totally inadequate. I was scared to death, if you want the truth of it. And so nothing I said could have impressed you or anyone else. But the message came through anyway. God's spirit and God's power did it, which made it clear that your life of faith is a response to God's power, not to some fancy mental or emotional footwork by me or anyone else. You coming to faith, you believing, Corinthians, was a result of God's work really had very little to do, nothing to do with me. I, I simply preached, I simply proclaimed, I simply announced the good news. And God by His Spirit did, did the work. What we need to understand is that the saving work of Christ is so unique and it's so unexpected that it had never entered into the mind or imagination of man to think, to think that one man's death could bring eternal life to all who believe. That, that didn't fit with the, um, uh, the template of all religious systems. It, it's foreign to us. It's, it's alien to our thinking that one man, one man could be sacrificed, would take our place, and all who believe in him, place their faith in him, would be saved. That what happened at Calvary was actually a redemptive work. Who would have known? Who would have suspected that? Even those observing that event would never have come to that conclusion. It would have been for them just the death of an other common, maybe exceptional criminal. wouldn't have known. It's not entered into the minds of man. It's not even captured our imagination. What God has done in Christ. It's a work. It's a work that's revealed to us through the Spirit. It's an understanding given to us by God. We need to remember this. We need to be weak. We really do need to be somewhat apprehensive, understanding. We can't persuade anyone. We can't, we can't argue anyone into the kingdom. We just present Jesus to them. Well, back to Corinth. What's Corinth like? It's strategically located on a narrow isthmus separating the Ionian and the Aegean Seas. 
It's at the intersection of the major trade routes, both north and south and east and west. It's a prosperous commercial center. And it's an extremely immoral city. Population is estimated to be between 100,000 and 700,000. A large city. Whereas Athens, their god was intellectual inquiry. Corinth's god was sensuality. The temple of Aphrodite was located there. She's the goddess of love and beauty and pleasure and procreation. There were a thousand prostitutes associated with her temple. They would gather in the temple at daytime and the evenings come into the city. Corinth was a city with a great population, with great wealth, and with great sin. When he arrives, Paul located a Jewish Christian couple. We don't know exactly how he had uh, known of them being there but he looks them up. Their names are Aquila and Priscilla. They'd been expelled from Rome. They were business people, probably had a, a business in Rome, but they were expelled by Emperor Claudius in 49 AD, along with all of the other Jews, had to leave the city. And they settled in Corinth and they established their business there. Now, what Paul has in common with them, uh, along with their, their shared faith in Christ, was that they shared the same trade. They were tent makers, more broadly understood as, as leather workers. And so Paul, after finding them and meeting them, uh, stays with them, and works alongside them. He's uh, making tents, apparently. So what we find is that Paul is a bivocational preacher. And he would um, go into a city, and if it was needed, he would, uh, he would work at his trade. He would support himself while he also preached the gospel and planted a church in that city. Now, we know he did this in uh, Thessalonica, and now we see him doing this in Corinth. So he labors there. He works there. He works at the trade during the week, and then on Sabbath, he would go to the synagogue, and there he would preach, and he'd teach, and he'd open the scriptures, and he'd, uh, try to, he'd try to present the case for Jesus being the Messiah, appealing to the scripture. He reasoned with the Jews and with the Gentile God-fearers at the synagogue. He reasoned with them from the scriptures. So... He'd work six days and then teach and preach on the seventh day, week in and week out. Well, it's a very demanding schedule. Here's what he writes to the Thessalonians. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. We work, work night and day. He just spent himself night and day and then preached the gospel. Well, given, given this background, there's an interesting line in verse 5 of the text when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. Uh, Eugene Peterson, again, I, I, he really captures well the imperfect tense of the verb occupied. He uh, writes the, he, he uh, renders the verse this way. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was able 
to give all his time to preaching and teaching. Now, it's not clearly stated, but it appears as though Paul's financial situation had changed with the arrival of Silas and Timothy. He's now able to devote himself to his primary work, that of preaching and teaching. So he's occupied with preaching, handling the word, opening the word to anyone that would listen. Perhaps he had um, received some support from Philippi, Thessalonica. Uh, Actually, Philippi, even though it wasn't a wealthy church, was one of the churches that did, on a regular basis, contribute to Paul and support him in ministry. Well, it freed him so that he could devote himself to what God had called him to do, and that's preach the gospel. Um, Paul recognized, uh, this is just an interesting kind of thing. To It, it exposes something about um, a man with a real calling and a, a pastor's heart, uh, especially when you're a church planter, uh, willing to do whatever's necessary. So he works, but then support comes. Now he's freed so that he can preach and devote himself to this work. This is the primary, the primary calling and task of a pastor, is to pray and to give himself to the ministry of the word. That, that's what we're called to do. Sometimes the circumstances are more demanding than others, and so certainly we see this in Paul. Now he's, he's thriving. He's now in this place where he is not distracted. He is preaching. Reminds me of John Calvin. I, I understand. I may not have this right, but I think he preached on average, at least for a season of his life in Geneva, he preached, I think, 14 to 17 times a week. Um, and, and not the same sermon. A different sermon. Plus, he wrote commentaries and wrote personal correspondence and traveled. I, you know, I have no idea how he did that. That man must have been tired. That's all he said. Well, Paul was tired, but he's devoted himself. He's occupied with the word. He is. He is preaching and exposing and opening scripture to everyone that will listen. Here's, by the way, Paul's admonition to Timothy, a young pastor. He writes to him, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry ministry is that of gospel proclamation. As a pastor, and I think I can speak for all of your pastors, uh, I understand that being free to pray and study and preach is a great privilege. And it's also a solemn responsibility. What confronted Paul in Corinth is what confronts us in Medford. Profound spiritual and moral decay. Everywhere Paul looked, he saw need. He saw need for Christian revival and moral reform. So what does he do? Let me just roll this back a bit. I think if you've been in church very long, you've heard some comments about Corinth. It was a city known for its uh, sexual license. 
Can you imagine a city just full of sailors and all sorts of people coming in and out, free to do whatever they want? And uh, it's an open city. And if you were called a Corinthian, it was not a compliment. It was notorious for its blatant, open sinfulness. Well, that's what Paul sees. So what does he do? What does he do? Well, he preached the gospel. He understood that for moral reform to be real and lasting, it has to be grounded in true Christian conversion. And certainly, moral behaviors can be imposed on us externally by law, and there's a place for this. But this, um, this shouldn't be confused with true moral transformation that redirects our affections and reshapes our character. Only God, through the gospel, can change uh, the inner man, reach into our, our minds, into those secret places of our lives, and change it, transform it. Make us love things that we once hated and hate things that we once loved. So Paul, even though these people, they, they, they rejected him, they rejected the gospel, he preached to, to the Jews, and he's telling them that Jesus is their Messiah. Um, he's reasoning with them, but they reject the message. In fact, they actively oppose him and they mock him. And so there comes this point where Paul, he honors their op opposition and he quit appealing to them. You know, sometimes we, we need to know when to let it go. Paul did. But he also let them know that they were now solely responsible before God for what they had done, for their rejection of this good news. Verse 16, verse 6, he says, your blood is on your own heads. I am innocent. Rejecting the gospel, turning your back on Christ is a serious matter. It's a life and death decision. None of us in this room should take it lightly. Are you trusting Jesus? Every day. Paul now turns his attention to the Gentiles. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. But he didn't go far from the synagogue. He just moved his base of ministry next door to the synagogue, to the house of Titius Justus. This man was a Gentile worshiper of Yahweh. And it seems... Uh, to be God's time for the Gentiles, Luke says that many of the Corinthians believed and were baptized. And Paul spent 18 months there in Corinth preaching and establishing the church. I think this serves to remind us that there are times and seasons in the life of any church, times of ingathering and seasons of solidification, and we've certainly gone through this. We've seen it. There's an ebb and flow to the life of a church. There are times that are prosperous and times that are quite lean. And what we're called to is to simply be faithful, faithful in our following of Christ and in our preaching of the gospel, no matter what the conditions are. Remain faithful, persevere. Now let's just get to the last little section. Um, given this fact that Paul came to Corinth struggling with self-doubt, God was gracious to him. God appeared to him. There's this vision that he has in verse 9. Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. Um, this, this had to be very reassuring to Paul 
when feeling, when feeling inadequate, and this applies to us, when we're feeling inadequate and not naturally capable of doing what's required of us, it's good to know that we don't have to be anxious and afraid. The statement, do not be afraid, surfaces uh, frequently in Scripture because feelings of inadequacy are very common among God's people. Maybe it's... Uh, it uh, exposes the kind of people God calls. Not always the most bold and the, the, the greatest leaders by nature. Well, we're confronted, all of us, with the demands of living a godly, Christ-honoring life, maybe with a, um, a task, uh, something that we're, we're going to be... Uh, to do, and it's, it's just beyond our natural abilities, well, this is when we, we need that reassuring word. Do not be afraid. Uh, you know, this is, a, this is a line that is frequent. In fact, it's one that's associated many, with many of the uh, Bible's heroes. Let me just list some. Uh, this, this phrase, do not be afraid, was stated to um, Joshua. Elijah, Elisha, Jeremiah, Jesus' disciples during uh, the storm on the Sea of Galilee, Peter, and then Paul here, and also to Paul again during shipwreck. Do not be afraid. Now, one thing I've, I've observed over the years now that I, I've grown as a Christian, and uh, now I'm uh, a little older, and also been able to observe lives of other Christians. And that is that um, the older we get and the more seasoned we become, uh, the more inadequate and uh, incapable we feel, especially regarding the Christian work we're called to. There's something about being young and... Uh, naive and somewhat dumb, uh, that, you know, you can just conquer the world. So after living, after being confronted with your own weaknesses and failures, that you begin to see yourself properly. You become more aware of your need uh, for God's help. And... Um, Perhaps this is as it should be, because Paul learned later to be content with his weaknesses, um, knowing that when he was weak, then Christ was, was made strong in his life. Uh, the Lord stated, stated it this way to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. My power comes to its intended end in your weakness. We're weak, he's strong. Isn't this reassuring? But why, why shouldn't we be afraid? Why should we speak boldly for Christ, even in our sense of inadequacy? Well, the answer is given in a short five-word phrase, for I am with you. This is all Paul needed to hear this is all he needed to know. It should be sufficient for us as well. For I am with you. You can hear, hear the same idea echoed in Paul's later letter to the Philippians when he writes, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, listen, this doesn't mean, and I've heard people apply it this way, and it's misapplied. It doesn't mean I can do everything I choose to do. But rather, it means I can do all that God calls me to do because he'll strengthen me. I want you to notice that there's an important reason for Paul to persevere, to continue preaching the gospel in Corinth. And to look at the last line of verse 10. For I 
have many in this city who are my people. Paul, don't give up. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. Continue to preach. Don't be silent. Why? Because I have many in this city who are my people. It appears that there were many in Corinth already known to God. They're his people. But they've not yet heard the gospel. And they've not yet come to faith in Christ. So Paul needed to stay and he needed to preach. Just let that settle in for a moment. To us, this is a, this is a mystery. Evangelism. Preaching the gospel. This is, this is God's way of effectually calling those he set apart unto salvation. Uh, according to Revelation 13, 8, the names of the elect were written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world. And in John 6, 37, Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. Now, we don't know who the elect are, nor should we. But we do know what they're like. Now, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 6, here's what the elect are like. They're sexually immoral. They're idolaters and adulterers. They're homosexuals and thieves, greedy individuals and drunkards, as well as revilers, individuals given to abusive speech. And they're swindlers. That's an interesting description. If you knew these individuals prior to their conversion, you'd never know that they were one of the elect. You would never know that their names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that they were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. This is an overwhelming thing, understanding that is presented to us in Scripture. And it troubles us, and we, we don't like it. But you know, it falls into the category of one of those secret things that belongs to the Lord, and we're not authorized to pry into it. So this being the case, we can be confident in evangelism. Evangelism is, is certainly a joint project between man and God. God's designed it this way, but ultimately its success isn't determined by our ability to persuade. Rather, we're simply to proclaim the gospel and the elect will respond in faith, some quickly and others more slowly. So we announce the good news and God does the saving, and he does it from beginning to end. Listen to J.F. Packer, Dr. Packer, on this point. So far from making evangelism pointless, the sovereignty of God and grace is one, the one thing that prevents evangelism from being pointless. For it creates the possibility, indeed the certainty, that evangelism will be fruitful. Apart from it, there is not even a possibility of evangelism being fruitful. Were it not for the sovereign grace of God, evangelism would be the most futile and useless enterprise that the world has ever seen, and there would be no more complete waste of time under the sun than to preach the Christian gospel. It's important for us to remember that we're called to preach, to bear witness to Christ, and make disciples. We're not called to save. That's God's work.
I used to sit under sermons where they told me that if I didn't preach or didn't witness to somebody, every person that passed me on the street that I didn't tell about Jesus, their blood was on my hands. That was a horrid, horrid burden to bear. It's God's business. I don't understand it, but I embrace it and I rest in it because he does all things well. Well, folks, thank you for listening. It's been a little bit of a lengthy time, but um, what we have is Paul. He stays in Corinth. He's there a year and a half. He preaches the gospel faithfully. He disciples new converts. The Jews, again, they try to disrupt his work unsuccessfully. And so he stays on many more days, finishes his work before he goes on. Here's a point, and I'll close with this point. Let's, let's persevere. Let's remain faithful. Let's serve Christ. Let's serve him even when things become difficult. Perhaps you're, you're in a hard season right now. Here's what you need to hear. Do not be afraid, for the Lord is with you. He's with you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the encouragement we receive from your word, how you speak to us through it. We thank you for those who have gone before. Enlarge our faith, strengthen us in the inner man, comfort our hearts. Lord, you know the details of every life, every person here today. You know those that are struggling, that are faced with problems that seem insurmountable. Would you reassure them again, reassure them this morning that you're with them. Give them peace. Now bless our time as we close around your table. In Jesus' name, amen.